Welcome to Dive Deep, a ministry of Christ Wesleyan Church where we seek to go deeper and become better disciples of Jesus Christ. I'm your host, Pastor Kyle Roberts, the pastor of spiritual formation here at CWC, and we are finishing up our series, Fireside Chats, which seeks to hear the messages from God that are on the hearts of our pastors. We're excited for you to hear from Pastor Ryan, our executive pastor here at Christ Wesleyan, and also our Sunbury campus pastor. Pastor Ryan, thanks for being here. Hey, so glad to be here. Thank really you. Really appreciate you being here. And my fun question for you today yeah. is, it's fun, but it's also on a little bit more serious note. You had read some passages from uh, Francis Chan's book, Forgotten God. And my question for you is, which Christian author has influenced you as a pastor the most? Or who are some influential authors that you've run into? Sure. I'm, I'm guessing people that know me well would probably just answer this for me right away because I talk about it all the time. Um, C.S. Lewis has been uh, significant for me. Um, not, uh, I mean, I, I love Narnia and I love the fictional stuff too, but um, some of his... Um, some of his other writings, more Christian themed topics, um, just some incredible stuff that's been there. Um, I like to, I like classic, that classic kind of literature feel, especially when thinking about my faith, um, things like mere Christianity, which actually, you know, the context here is so perfect because those were radio interviews that were then made into a book. Um, but it's just, you can get a little bit outside of the trends that we talk through or the trendy things that we talk through in our faith. And you just kind of come back to the things that are timeless. And those tend to be my go-tos um, when I'm trying to think through something new or come back. Cause it, it, you can get so lost in what's a trend here and what really just needs to be foundational. Um, and so I'll go back to that a lot. But after that, um, Francis Chan certainly has been significant, not only the books, but done a lot of video series of his and uh, just have always really appreciated the genuineness that he appears to have and uh, just really appreciate that in his writing, too. Yeah, our small group has gone through a couple of his studies. Forgotten God was the most recent one that we went through. And he's just so influential and so thoughtful in the way that he approaches these kind of topics. And it's always scripturally based, which I really appreciate. Yeah, about that's, him that's too. been what's key for me is it always comes back to the scripture. And one of his other books um, is called Erasing Hell. And it was a response to some things that were happening at the time too, uh, with other churches that were really trying to uh, eliminate that part of scripture. And um, I just remember one of the lines he says in that book is, as much as I would personally like to maybe think that there's no hell, he just said, scripturally, I cannot support that. And I think that has to, isn't that like, shouldn't that be the, the motto of our life is like, I feel this way, but boy, I just have to come back to scripture. And so that, yeah, that's definitely a reason for, for me too with him is just, it always comes back to the Bible. Right. Yeah, that scriptural foundation is just so incredibly important. No matter what church you're a part of, it's just that's something that you really have to look out for. So if you could choose one book from C.S. Lewis that you would, that is your favorite, what would that one be? I think it would probably have to be Mere Christianity. Um, and I know it wasn't really a book, but it became a book. Um but I get, I listen to that. I just listened to it uh, about a month ago. I've always read it and I decided to listen to it because it was the original context of it. And I took like all new things out of it hmm. again, just listening this time. And it was a free audio book on online. And so um, I think it would have to be that just because it's been the most influential. But as far as um, enjoyable, um, where I just really, really enjoyed doing it. Um, there's a book called Surprised by Joy, and it was sort of a, a biography, an, an autobiography, um, in a sense, about his earlier life and some of the things, but Surprised by Joy is just a totally enjoyable read. Um, encouraging to the faith, but all-time mere Christianity. That's really cool. I didn't realize that it was in an audiobook format, and I also didn't realize it was from a radio show earlier on. Yeah, so yeah. I'll have to look for that and, and put that into practice. Yep. So let's go ahead and get a quick recap of your sermon from this past Sunday. Can you give that to us? Sure. And I, as I was sharing with you a little bit earlier today, uh, I think I went through three or four different versions of this sermon. Um, 
I knew early in the week I was going to keep uh, an outline very, very simple um, because, frankly, I wasn't ready to commit to any one outline at that point. You know, our, our wonderful team behind the scenes uh, does things very early, and so we're, we're trying to get things to them early in the week, and I just said, I'm going to keep it simple, and so I gave a, a next-to-nothing outline because I knew I wanted to be open, but... This concept, I knew right away when Pastor Brandon said, we're going to do a series just kind of sharing from your heart. Um, I just knew God was hitting me over and over again with this idea of the Holy Spirit and the importance of him in our lives. And so I knew I was going there, but I didn't know exactly what avenue. And that's where I was back and forth all week. And God really led me into Acts chapter 8. And um, I'd studied this character of Simon the Sorcerer um, before, but... I never at this level. And so um, did a bunch of research about him. Didn't need to share that necessarily, but I needed that context to kind of give because there's not a lot in the passage about Simon. And so uh, we talked about the fact that God um, is here for us in the sense that he's here for us. But really, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, I'm not talking about, well, God's not here for us. We're here for him. I'm saying we are created to serve his purposes and not the other way around. And so much of our world and um, popular thinking is putting God second, saying that we're creating the concept of God. And so I referenced uh, Rich Mullins yesterday, the song Creed, but it's this is something that's making me not any invention of any man. But everything in our culture right now is saying, if we think it, if we feel it, then that's what's right, instead of having that guideline and principle. So we talked about the Holy Spirit not being here for us, but we are here for him and his purposes. And so with Simon the sorcerer, his he was seeing the disciples, or the apostles rather, uh, perform these incredible miracles. And he was a magician, essentially, and he's going this is a wonderful opportunity. And so he actually is baptized. He's following Philip around. And then, you know, Peter comes in and he's seeing them lay hands on people and then receive the Holy Spirit. Well, he's saying, I want to be able to do this, you know? And so can I, can I pay for that service to be able to do that? And um, there's not a ton of times where you go, there needs to be a rebuke here, but, Jesus offers a lot of them scripturally right. when we see him. And Peter's one who's been the recipient of rebuke, if you remember the whole conversation with Paul that he had. And in this case, Peter's saying, no way. Like, you cannot buy this power. God, this cannot be bought. You can be no part of this, he says. And uh, it's a very strong response. And it drives Simon directly into a spirit of repentance. He's saying, like, oh, goodness, like, please forgive me because I don't want these consequences that you've said will come to me. And, um, and so you don't hear it about him ever again. He never shows up. He's kind of like Jesus, earthly father, Joseph, you know, it's kind of like a one time appearance and then we don't hear from him. But, um, it, there's so many takeaways there of, I cannot build an agenda or build my show, my magic act. I cannot build that and then say, Holy Spirit, I'd like to invite you into this plan. Um, isn't that just absurd? And yet we operate that way. And it's saying, no, you've saved me to invite me into your plan, into your purposes. And that's really what we talked about yesterday is what does it look like when you're leading, when you're not leading him, he's leading you. And that was the question we ended with is who's leading who? Right. Yeah, that was one of the key points in my own sermon a couple of weeks ago was, are you surrendering to what yep. God's will is in your life rather than your own? And that that key theme we can see all throughout Scripture when, um, say, the Israelites, they are a prime example of what it means to either follow in what God wants them to or they are demanding of God to say, this is how we want it to happen, Lord. For example, we want a king. We want a king. We we want somebody that's just like these other nations that can lead us. And then God looks at them and says, aren't I enough? Yeah. Am I not your king? Okay, fine. If you want him so bad, here you go. And then you can see almost the downfall of Israel from that point on, which is 
crazy, but you yeah, can right. see that theme throughout Scripture. It's that wanting our own will versus wanting what God's will is. So impactful and important. I remember a college professor said to me one time, we have to be careful that we don't create Ishmael's. Meaning, you look at that story of Abraham and Sarah, and God promised a child to them, and Abraham's like, I, well, God's not doing it in my time and my plan, so I'm going to create an, an avenue here. Do it my own way. And do it my hmm. own way. And, and Ishmael was born, and, and we're still seeing the impact of that decision, even in modern day time, with the feuding that has existed between those two people groups and, uh, you know, not wanting to create Ishmael's because sometimes God will say, okay, I'll let you do it. Like you're saying, but and, hear the consequences. Yeah, you're going to live this out. And, uh, yep. it's, boy, it's scary to think when God lets us, when, if you want God to let you choose, you better be prepared for what that means. Right. Well, that kind of leads me into one of the questions that I had for you. What is one moment in your life when you look back and can say, I should have listened to the Holy Spirit and what he wanted me to do? What was one of those key moments? There is, this is not going to seem very significant um, to some people, but I'll try to make it feel significant because that's how it was for me. Um, And I think we may have even talked about this before. And if it was in a dive deep, then wonderful. It'll be a feeling of nostalgia. Yeah. I had a pretty significant um, collection of movies, um, and I'd started when I was younger, and my dad and I loved, that was one of our things, we loved watching movies together, we still do, and I um, I had built up quite a collection, which began as VHS, you know, so I had all these, and then, you know, as DVDs and Blu-rays and all this stuff was coming out, and now, you know, digital collections aren't visually that impressive, but we collect, you know, I was collecting these things. I had collected, I don't even know the count. If if it wasn't thousands, it was many hundreds of movies. And I remember sitting in a college classroom where God was saying, will you give those up if I asked? And it was just as clear as day. And he wasn't asking me to, but he said, would you if I asked? And I remember my response in that moment in my heart of hearts was no. And it had been this thing that, I mean, did it really matter? It's not like my life depended on it or anything, but it was just something that I had built up. And it was a point of pride. And I said no to him quietly in that moment. And it took some additional breaking me down that, I mean, I, I'm glad I I went through. But there was a time that Amanda and I were sitting in a a pastor's wife's conference kind of thing. And God said, I'm asking now, give those up. And in that moment I knew because I'd gone through some things, which did I have consequences directly related to those movies? No, but there were other things that that was just an indicator of that. I'd kept compartments and I said, okay, God, I'll give these up now. And I literally sold them and uh, I paid off a small student loan. So <laughs> it gives you an idea of how many there were. Mm-hmm. And that feeling of surrender in that moment, it was like, I think the last thing I was really holding on to. Cause you know, you, you kind of surrender to God incrementally in some ways. I mean, you have these big moments, but then you have all these little asks where God is saying, Hey, will you give this up? Will you, will you give this to me? And it felt like a last point of surrender for me of, of like this stupid thing over here, but it was indicative of something much greater in hmm. me. And, uh, and I have to say like, I, would I do it differently? Yeah, I would do it differently, but I don't know. I mean, God used that, that period of time to, to create additional uh, Christ likeness in me that I didn't have prior to that. So you mentioned that in this specific time in your life, you allowed God into certain compartments, but not necessarily others. Can you dive more into that and talk more to that? Yeah. I think the the Christian word for this area is just called holiness, sanctification, Christ likeness, whatever we want to call it. Um, I am not the man I was when I said yes to Jesus for the first time. You know, that moment of salvation 
is a simple moment in many ways. It's profound spiritually and eternally, but it's simple and a child can accomplish this. So it doesn't take the wisest of the wise to receive Christ. There's so much work that comes after that moment, not work that's going to save me, but work that's going to sanctify me or make me more like Christ. And so to me, salvation is just the beginning. I mean, it's a wonderful beginning and it, it's a change of course, you know. I was destined for hell. I'm now going to heaven. Yes, I'm saved, period. But then the work that follows salvation, this beautiful work of the Holy Spirit where he is making me more and more like Christ, he is going to go through the house and he's going to ask for every single room, every single inch of that house, and it's not overnight. Because so many times in my life, he's had to start with certain things that now to me seems silly, but he had to have that little part. And he would say, I'm not sure that's how you'd want to respond there, you know. And for some, maybe it's things like, you know, I had to give up using bad language, which seems obvious, but it, you know, when we're starting, it's like, no, I, that's something I need to need to give up. Or for some, that's like a last step where it's like, that's the last holdout. It just depends on the person. You know, and for me, I didn't have to give up these incredible, obvious, like huge, glaring public things that I had to give up or turn from. But for me, it was just a lot of small steps of, Ryan, is that really how you would want to respond? Or were you totally honest when you said that? Or did you kind of embellish there because you like to make the story a little bit better? And, Hmm. you know, things like that. And to me, each of those feels like a compartment or a room of the house where God's saying, I went in on that room. Like, what's behind that door? And you go, oh, no, God, like, um, you don't want to see in there. Like, just come out here where it's nice and clean. And God knows, no, I want I want access to that room, too, because I want all of you. Because until you're fully surrendered to him, and it doesn't mean you're perfect. Heavens, no, I mean, I will never achieve that in this life. Mm-hmm. But it does mean that I'm surrendering my will more and more to him. And certainly in the Wesleyan Church, we would say sin is willful. It's something that I can choose to do or not choose to do. On my own strength, I'm powerless to not sin. But with the Holy Spirit taking over more and more of me, the natural result is going to be less and less sin. And uh, and so that act of sanctification, to me, it's a journey. It's progressive. It's never finished. Um, Wesleyans would say there's no height of holiness that I can't fall from. You know, I want to make all my college professors proud that might be listening. <laughs> um, but I really also want to just continue to be in this place of if if I get to the point where I'm proud about how good I am, well, then pride's still my issue, you know? So right. it's like there's got to be this continual attitude of growth and that the God wants to do more in my life. But that's what I mean by those compartments is just – The Holy Spirit is going to never stop making us more like Jesus. Sure. And as I'm thinking about your response and really thinking about, you had said that you have grown up in the church. There weren't necessarily any like serious, significant like areas of sin in your life per se that to outward folks. People who are on the outside, they could right. clearly say like, oh, well, if you're in fornication, you're in sin. Right. Or if you're in adultery, you're in sin. Right. Name whatever sin would be there, gluttony, pride, lust, etc. Mm-hmm. So what do you think some of the compartments are that people may not even recognize that they're holding on to? Or some of the things that the Holy Spirit wants to open up, but people may be hesitant to? What do you think some of those compartments are, especially for those who would consider themselves lifelong Christians? Right. Um, as I sit here with you, you and I could have a perfectly good conversation and you don't know my thoughts. You know, there could be troubling thoughts in there. There could be sinful thoughts there. There could be distractions, all sorts of things that as we have a conversation, it might end and you'll never be the wiser too. To me, I think one of the hardest things for the believer, and so maybe it is a really big deal, but it's not outwardly big, um, to me is knowing that moment where my thoughts are not hidden from God ever. I can never have a conversation with him where he doesn't completely know me and everything that's happening. To stop pretending like God doesn't know is a big factor. That was a big factor for me of having elephants in the room with God 
and pretending like he doesn't see them. And so that could be something like, again, an embellishment that you don't call a lie or doing something selfishly that nobody will ever know was selfish, but I know it was. Or like we talked about yesterday, attention, doing something for attention's sake and acting innocent like, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize I'd get so many compliments on that post when I posted it. But, boy, I'm eating them up, you know. Knowing that God knows all that, to become to the place where I can feel before God there isn't something going on. And so I've come to that place in my life where I go, I know I'm not fooling God with anything. And so even those things that the world would never see, like whether it's a lustful thought or whether it's a a dishonesty that has no real consequence but just might keep something easier or make something a little bit better— Though even those little things matter to God. And I think they're some of the hardest to get rid of because nobody will ever know them unless you were truly honest and said it to somebody, you know. But those things to me are, you know, it's one thing if you're, like you said, I'm living in sin and everybody knows it and I know it and God knows it. You know, I can turn from that and have incredible accountability in it. But just read Wesley's uh, Holy Club questions you know he would get a group of people together uh, men with men women with women he'd have these holy clubs and they would ask each other look that list up online i encourage you go google it wesley's holy club questions now you're talking about accountability Mm -hmm. there is like no stone unturned in these questions and this is the stuff i'm talking about where like god doesn't even need to ask me these questions he already knows and for a while, I'm going to be fully honest with him and stop acting like he doesn't. That's a big step in the life of the believer. Where it's like, because you can fool everybody else. You cannot fool God. Right. Yeah. I don't know if that answers it, but that's, boy, that's a, that's a component where we think like, oh, nobody, nobody knows. And nobody's ever going to know that. You know, and it's not even that substantial. It's just, but it's something between you and God. Right. I think that that's something that a lot of people miss and why it's so important to be a part of a small group or at least be a part of a mentoring relationship that you can be honest with yourself and that you can actively reflect with somebody too, especially for those things that you may think are these things, it may not necessarily be sin, but is it separating me from God? Right. Because sin is separation from God. So some of the things that we've talked about here on Dive Deep here recently is like technology can be one of those things that in and of itself is not sinful. Right. In fact, oftentimes it's beneficial, but it can become a crutch. It can become something that is a slippery slope that leads you into sin and that separation. Right. So having somebody that you can talk to, that you can be honest with, and that you can they can challenge you. They can rebuke you, say, in some moments, kind of like yeah. Peter did t- to Simon in this moment. Are you truly using it for the glory of the kingdom of God or are you using it for your own gain? And fill in the blank with that. It doesn't right. have to be specifically technology. It could be a million different things. It could be your family. That is one of the things that can be worshipped over God nowadays. That's right. And that's it's so easy to as well. So we need to make sure to have God as our priority and everything will fall into place after that. The questions get really hard when you surrender fully to the Holy Spirit because what initially might have been like a hard question early on in your faith, you know, like, will you stop using, you know, bad language? And you go, oh, that would be really hard, you know, early on, where now it's like, okay, that's not so much the struggle for me anymore. Some of the questions I posed yesterday that that I took from Danielle Strickland, who we saw speak down in Florida last uh, this last March. Questions like, what if you end up with less than what you started with? And we're not talking about a conscience question here. We're talking about like surrender questions. And this is that upside down kingdom that we talked about yesterday. What if the destination was different than you thought? What if I do this differently? What if I don't use the buildings and the budgets and the systems? And it's like, oh, am I okay with that? And now it's like this question of surrender becomes more about not sin versus making a right choice. 
it's talking about like obedience, even if it means total sacrifice. Right. I asked the question, what if your life ends up looking more like Jeremiah than it does David? Hmm. And both of whom were, were faithful to God both in the midst of their call. Very different lives. Right. One living in like poverty and shame and being, you know, tortured and mocked and betrayed. And the other is a king living a king's life. And not hmm. that either of them, they both had challenges, but are we okay if God doesn't give us the life of a king? Are we okay if he gives us the life of a prophet? And you go, oh, well, that's not fair. That's a rough thought. You know? Yeah. But surrender means whatever it means. And you go, well, this stinks. Is this <laughs> is that what being a Christian is? And you go, you know what, though? We've got to be faithful because God will place us where nobody else can be. And you go, if I don't do, if I'm not faithful here, if I don't surrender here, what, who's going to miss out on eternity because I'm not obedient? And you go, okay, then wow, really just, it's not about this life. This life's purpose is to get us to eternity mm-hmm. where it's actually our home. And then it's going to be incredible, but this life may not have, have the, the pleasures that, that somebody else might have. Who's also living totally right. You have to be okay if God asks you to be Jeremiah. Who? That's hard. That's rough. This is a whole yeah. other podcast. I know. The well, Jeremiah podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much, Pastor Ryan, for being here with us today. And thank you, audience, for joining us here for this Dive Deep. The heart of why we do this podcast is to bring about transformation for Christians in our community and across the globe in any walk of life to look and be more like Jesus. Be sure to spread the word so more people can benefit from this podcast. You can find us at cwc.life slash dive dash deep at CWC Dive Deep on Apple Podcasts and on YouTube at our Christ Wesleyan Church channel. Feel free to send in any questions that you as an online que- uh, you as an online audience may have as well. You can do so by either texting the question to 570-273-0088 with the words dive deep at the front of it. And you can also go to cwc.life slash dive dash deep and leave a question there in our question form. Well, thank you again for joining us here. And I pray that this gathering has made you more aware of God's plan and his presence in your life. We'll see you next week. Thank you.